All right. How's everybody doing today? Well, awesome. wonderful. You had a great week. Yeah. Yes. Everything's going well. Yes, sir. Yes. Is everything coming out okay? Yes. Yes. I hope so. All right. All right. Well, welcome to OHI. For those who don't know who I am, my name is Dr. Andy Tutino. I go by Dr. Andy. It's real easy that way. And I'm the treating chiropractor here at OHI. And as people continue to trickle in, I go through some of the intro stuff and how I arrived at a place like this. And it's really quite simple. I have two practices. I have a main office outside of here. I also practice in this location. However, before I arrived to a place like this, people from here were walking into my office. I didn't know this place was here. And of course, when you would commit to my office, I would ask you, how did you hear from me? Where are you from? Things like that. Now, I mean, I'm from New York, I'm from San Francisco, I'm from Florida, I'm from Brazil, I'm from LA, I'm from China, I'm from Brazil, I'm from you know, Japan. I said, damn, I'm good. They're from all the world to see me. <laughs> but that's not what happened. You see, they were coming to this place. I said, where are you staying? Stay right behind you. And of course, I would look outside and I wouldn't see anything behind me. So after the fifth or sixth time, I got in my car and I drove around the block. You know, when you go to work, you go straight to work and you go straight home. I finally drove around the block. And there it is, a brown little sign, they still have it. And it says, Optum Health Institute. So I drove up on the premises. I saw people drinking a bunch of green stuff. I said, whoa, what a place. I spoke to them, they spoke to me. And now on my 19th and a half year here, that's how that happened, you see. However, 17 years ago, they asked me if I'd like to teach this class on digestion for them. I said, sure, let me look at the material. And I did. And I told them, wow, this takes a year learning med school. We're going to do it in an hour and 15 minutes. So I want you to know we're going to go very fast today. I promise you, we're going to fly. In all fairness to you, I do repeat myself many times. We go over and over and over. As I mentioned to you, I am a practicing doctor. So I'm going to share things with you that I share with my patients. When it comes to questions, I like questions. I'll take as many questions as I can possibly handle. But I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Hold on to your questions for a little while. And the only reason I ask you to do that, if I start taking questions at the beginning of the class, we're not going to get past our teeth. That's the only reason. Other than that, I'll take them. And when it comes to the answers to the questions, I don't know everything. I'll be the first one to tell you that I don't know everything. So I did the best I can to answer it, but just because I don't know the answer, that doesn't mean it was a good question or bad question. It just means I don't know the answer. Fair enough? Everyone ready? Ready to get started today? Yeah. All right, here we go. So we're going to speak about today. We're going to get into the brain a little bit. We're going to go down into our mouth, go down the esophagus, speak about the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, out the door. Thank you very much. Just finished digestion class. Have a rest of the good afternoon. Right? Okay, we'll slow down a little bit. <laughs> digestion begins in the brain. <clears throat> the nervous system controls and coordinates all of the functions in the body. And yes, it does that with digestion. There is what they call the cephalic portion to digestion. In other words, when your mouth starts to water and you're all excited when you're about to drink your wheatgrass juice, when that's happening to you, that's up here. And that's called the cephalic portion to digestion. And what happens is, your brain says, hey, start producing some acid. Get the juices flowing. Get ready to break this stuff down. Normally, we're going to produce about 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid in our stomach due to the cephalic portion to digestion. However, studies have shown individuals with chronic levels of stress for long periods of time can produce up to 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid five times that amount. And that's where you make that connection. High levels of stress for long periods of time can produce what? Gastric ulcers. That's one of the ways that it can happen. Now where in the brain you experience the hunger sensation is a place called the hypothalamus located right about there. All you need to know is the hypothalamus is the one that controls the hunger sensation. It's the one that's probably speaking to some of you right now. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Well, it's all in your head. Literally, right? <laughs> Things you're more familiar with. Mouth and teeth. You brush and floss your teeth every day because you want a beautiful smile. Well, that's part of the reason. However, it's not the reason. The reason you brush and floss your teeth every day is you need your teeth to last. You're doing preventative medicine here. Good dental hygiene. Why? Because you chew your food 20 to 30 times before you swallow. You need to mechanically break it down. So Mr. Jones comes into the office. 
Hi, Mr. Jones, how are you? And he smiles. And he's lost a lot of his teeth. He's got gingivitis, tooth decay. In fact, when he smiles, it's Halloween every day for him. Right? We've seen people like that before. That's his circumstance, okay? So we give him an exam, this and that, whatever. He goes back in a week. Mr. Jones, what? what? I know what's wrong with you. It seems to me that you're suffering from malnutrition. Mr. Jones, no candy. What are you, nuts? I own Albertson's grocery store. I eat whatever I want, whenever I want. How could you say I'm malnourished? Well, you see, Mr. Jones, when you smile, it's Halloween every day for you. Therefore, you've lost the ability to mechanically break your food down properly. You therefore lose the ability to absorb it correctly. Over a period of years, you are in a state of malnourishment. And that's exactly what happens. The next thing that happens is something like this. The patient says, no, Doc Eddie, I don't eat apples. Why? You don't like them? No, I like them. They want to eat them, it hurts my mouth, so I don't eat them. That's another way the patient becomes malnourished. They begin to avoid certain foods altogether just because it hurts their mouth when they eat it. Please take care of your teeth. Brush and floss them every day. If we get a beautiful smile on the way, we'll take that too. That's the dental commercial. All right, now, <laughs> looking inside our mouth, we have some glands. Underneath the tongue, we have the sublingual gland. Over by the jaw, we have the submandibular gland. These two glands are primarily responsible for providing salivary juices. Hard to eat with a dry mouth, correct? This is what they're going to help us do. This gland right here is called the parotid gland. And it's going to square an enzyme called tylen. Tylen begins to break down starch in our mouth. Three to five percent of the starch we eat is going to be broken down in our mouth be the enzyme called tylen. So now what do we have going on here? We have mechanical breakdown of our food via our teeth, correct? And now we have enzymatic breakdown of our food via the enzyme called tylen. The question I have for you people is this. How much tylen do you mix in when you go like this? Cook, let's swallow, 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 cook, let's How much? How much? A little. A little bit. Not much. Did you help yourself? No. You sabotaged yourself. That's just since your gut like this. Oh my gosh, I'm going to pass out. I can't even breathe. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Because <laughs> you're in a big fat what when you ate your meal? What? What? Rush. Hurry. Rush. What state of mind should you be in when you eat your meals? You should be what? Relaxed. Relaxed. Calm. We'll speak about that later on. Why it's important for digestion. The esophagus. The esophagus is quite unique. It goes from here to here. It's made up of different types of muscle. The body has different types of muscle in it. The first third is called strident muscle or voluntary type muscle. All of this in our bodies out here is voluntary type muscle. Look at that. You can control it. You can do what you want with it. But the body has another type of muscle in it. It's called smooth muscle or involuntary type muscle. The next two-thirds of the esophagus is made up of this type. Most of the organs in our body are surrounded with this type of muscle. In other words, you don't say, liver, scoot over. You don't say, gallbladder, squeeze right now. It doesn't work that way. Subconscious mind controls that system. So now, we need to ask the question, why it is that Mother Nature said we can control the first third, not the next two-thirds. Here's one of the reasons why. Have you noticed when a baby's first born, the baby's upside down, the baby breastfeeds, the baby doesn't choke? Watch that. Take them home, give them a bottle of milk, they're upside down. They do it, no problem, we do it, we choke. How come? Because Mother Nature has her way. That's how come. It's a survival mechanism. We can control the first third. Now most of us are going to lose this ability. We're going to sit at the table like good adults, and gravity works for you, so if you don't use it, you lose it. That's right. If you had the urge of drinking upside down again, you could. You line the carpet over here, water would spill over the place, you choke a few times, and then you'd be drinking upside down. <laughs> now, why would you want to do that? I have no idea why you'd want to do that. A circus act, a bar, a baby, but you could do it. This, however, this kind of muscle out here is a quick acting muscle. It moves very fast, but it does another thing too. It gets tired quickly also. In other words, if we did an experiment today, and we said, look, Doc Andy, we want to know how long you can hold our dumbbells 15 pounds a piece. How long can I do that for? A minute? 
two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, there's no way I'm done. Have you noticed, however, after you've eaten a meal, if you cough, your food doesn't come back up, not does it? In fact, if you sneeze, which is a lot of pressure, food doesn't come back up, not does it? In fact, if you eat and then you go to the gym and you lift weights, lots of pressure, food doesn't come back up, not does it? And the reason it doesn't do that is because the esophagus can stay contracted up to six hours after a meal. Because the smooth muscle, the type of muscle we don't control through our conscious mind, moves very slowly. But the contraction is long lasting. See, patients have asked the question, well, geez, Doc Andy, if I've got a diseased esophagus, why don't they just pull that thing out? Put in a plastic PVC pipe. I swallow, it goes to the stomach, and that's it. Why don't they just do that? Because we can't. We don't have the technology to do that. The esophagus is always changing. It's contracting. It's relaxing. It's always moving. So we have to make sure we don't do things to hurt that organ. So let's take a look at it. In swallowing, something has to happen. We have two tubes in our throat. We have the esophagus, we call the food tube. Water and food will go down the esophagus. And then we have the trachea. We can call it the air tube. We breathe and speak through the trachea. What separates the both of them is this thing right here, called the epiglottis. It's a flap in the rear of the throat, and how it works is like this. As I'm speaking right now, the epiglottis is going to flip over, boom, close off the esophagus, the food tube. Air is going to come through the lungs, Trachea, larynx, and pharynx, I'm going to breathe and speak. When it comes to swallowing, however, the epiglottis is going to flip over, boom, close off the trachea, the air tube, and water, food, etc. goes down the esophagus into the stomach. The question I have for you people is this. What happens when you're talking and eating at the same time? The epiglottis goes like this. When I talk, I talk, I talk, I talk, I get so confused. And what happens when this gets confused? What happens to us? We can what? We can choke, that's right. I kid about it, I laugh about it, but it is an unfortunate thing that people are choking down food all over the world every single year. So let's back up again. What state of mind should we be in when we're eating our meals? We should be what? Relaxed, Relaxed calm. And then you should be what else? Quiet. There it is. Quiet at the dinner table. Now you know why. This is one of the reasons why, okay? Peristalsis, what is that? That is the contraction and movement of food through the gastrointestinal tract. That's what we're speaking about today, is the GI tract. We have three major peristaltic movements a day. That's in association with three major meals a day. If you would have five major meals a day, you then would have five major peristaltic movements a day. However, how the food moves through the esophagus is going to be extremely different how it moves through the small intestine and large intestine. How it moves through the esophagus is going to be straight through. Think of your esophagus as a rubber band that is muscle, has tone. When you swallow, clunk, 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 straight into the stomach. Now, for those of us who experience heartburn, obviously our heart is not burning. So you'd ask the question, then what is burning? The inside of the esophageal wall is burning. Is that a good thing or bad thing? That is the bad thing. What can we get? Esophageal what? Ulcers. Ulcers. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. If you poke a hole in your esophagus, you now have food being spilled into your body. You think that's a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. So I'm going to ask you, if you're an individual that has chronic heartburn five, six, seven times a week, all the time, try to find out why and fix it. Because you're going to develop a health opportunity you just don't need. I am not speaking about Friday night is pizza night, six slices later, blah, blah, fizz, fizz. I know what that's about. I'm speaking about five, six, seven times a week all the time. You can take up this gastric reflux to find out why and fix it. Because you're going to develop a health opportunity you just don't need. 